And so the way that we're going to do this is by saying, well, under the null hypothesis, there's really no difference between the x's and the y's. They all have the same mean under the null hypothesis. So I'm just going to scramble them. I'm just going to shuffle them together. I'm going to permute them. I'm going to resample them. And I'm going to generate a t-statistic on that shuffled data. I'm going to do that a huge number of times in order to simulate the null distribution. And the idea here is that if I shuffle the data, I'm essentially guaranteeing that the null distribution is correct. Because even if there was a dis difference, once I've shuffled it, those, that difference will go away. Or stated another way, under the null distribution, it doesn't matter whether we shuffled our data. It's all the same either way. Yeah. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to compute a two-sample t-statistic on our data. And then we're going to do something a huge number of times where B is a really big number. Like if you're lazy, then B might be 100. And if you are a very energetic person, or actually maybe if you're a lazy person because you're code will run for a long time, so you'll have a long time to go get a coffee. Well, whatever. Your B might be larger, like 10,000. But bigger B is better. So what you're going to do is you're going to randomly shuffle the observations, and then you're going to call the first n sub x observations, x1 star through x n x star, and the remaining observations are going to be y1 star through y n y star. So all that you've done so far is you took your x's and your y's, you put them in a basket, you shook up the basket, you grabbed n x and called them x stars, you grabbed n y, called them y stars. And now you're going to compute a two-sample t-statistic on this shuffled data, and you're going to call it t-star, where the little b is because this is the little b time that we're going to do this procedure. And then after we've done this capital B times, like 1,000 times, we're going to compute a p-value. And the p-value is just the fraction of the time that the t-statistic on the shuffled data exceeded an absolute value, the t-statistic on the real data. So what does this notation mean, Gareth, that one with the subscript? So this is just counts as a one, a value of one, if this uh, quantity in the parentheses is true and zero otherwise. So it's just a, so with the summation here, this is just counting the number of times that's true. Yeah, so this, the numerator is just the number of simulated data sets or the number of uh, resampled data sets, reshuffled data sets for which the test statistic exceeded the test statistic that we got on our real data. And I'm dividing it by the number of times I did this reshuffling. And the reason we have these absolute values here is because we're computing a, a two-sided p-value where we're equally interested in um, if the means are unequal, we're equally interested in the x's mean being larger than the y's mean versus the y's mean being larger than the x's mean. This is a two-sided p-value. If you only wanted a one-sided p-value, you could get rid of those absolute values. And the concept here is that if the resampled t-statistics are almost all smaller than the observed t-statistic, then we're pretty suspicious that the null hypothesis is not true. But if we get quite a few resampled t-statistics that are just as large or even larger than what we observed, then we're not so interested. We, we, we're, we're no longer suspicious about that value. Right. So here's what we get if we uh, take some gene expression data and we look at a particular gene where we have a, a control group and treatment group measured for this gene. And for this particular gene on the real data, our t-statistic is negative 2.09. That's the blue line. And in orange, I'm showing you the theoretical null distribution for that t-statistic. So that's in orange. And if I take this shuffling or resampling approach in order to simulate the null distribution, I get the histogram shown in yellow. And indeed, what I see here is that the, the yellow histogram, so that reshuffled distribution that I got for the null distribution, is pretty similar to the theoretical null distribution shown in orange doesn't really matter much that I did reshuffling. And in fact here, the theoretical p-value, if I use that theoretical normal 0, 1 distribution as my null distribution for the t-statistic is 0.041, my resampling p-value is 0.042. So in this particular example, this was a big load of nothing. And the reason it was a big load of nothing, again, is because the theoretical null distribution actually was pretty close to my reshuffled null distribution anyway. So it just didn't really matter. Though it does add confidence that we had the right answer. Yeah, there is something to be said for just, like, using a resampling approach when you can, because, like, why not? It just feels a little, like, like you've made fewer assumptions. And actually, here is on the same data set a different gene, and you can really see. Now, here's a gene where our results are actually a bit different, depending on whether I use the theoretical null distribution shown in orange versus the reshuffled null distribution shown in yellow as the yellow histogram. And we can see that actually um, those two distributions do look a bit different. Our observed test statistic is negative 0.5696. And my theoretical p-value resulting from the theoretical null distribution is 0.571, whereas the resampling p-value is 0.673. 
So in this particular case, both p-values are large, so this won't really probably affect any conclusions that I draw about the data, but, or rather conclusions that I draw from the data. But nonetheless, we can see here that sometimes a resampling approach can give you a result that is a bit different. And in general, a resampling approach, you're like kind of trading off computational time for making slightly weaker assumptions. And the computer doesn't mind doing that extra work, so why A computer not? doesn't mind doing the extra work, that's true. And it's always a good excuse to like go get a long coffee while your computer is running through those capital B equals 10,000 um, reshuffles. All right, so when are resampling approaches useful? Well, they're, they're definitely useful if the theoretical null distribution is unavailable. So in the case of a two-sample t-statistic, if you have a large sample size, this is just my opinion, and a different statistician might disagree with me. I feel like if you're doing a two-sample t-statistic and your sample size is really, really large, maybe you don't really need a resampling approach. But if your sample size is smaller, then that's a really good reason you might want a resampling approach for a two-sample t-test, because in that case, we actually don't know the theoretical null distribution. Or maybe there's a test statistic that you're interested in or a null hypothesis you're testing for which you really just don't know the theoretical null distribution at all without making some really strong assumptions. So one way to think about this is that resampling approaches, maybe we can just say they're always useful because they don't usually cost us very much to do. And um, they can allow us to overcome some hurdles associated with not knowing a theoretical null distribution. So here we've talked about using resampling to compute a p-value. It turns out you can also use a resampling approach to control the FDR. If you look it up in the textbook, actually, we work through that. And we also work through it in the R lab. So you can see how we can use resampling to control FDR in the book. Um, we're not going to cover it today in this lecture. And then finally, here we talked about a two-sample t-test. But you can develop similar approaches for other test statistics. It just requires a bit of thinking. It's not usually like just a command in R where you just like type it in and then you get a p-value out. You need to think about like how would you design a resampling approach based on your particular null hypothesis and your particular test statistic. And it's not always so clear how to do it. A two-sample t-statistic is kind of like a very easy example, but it can often be trickier. All right, well, mm -hmm. that's it. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to trying to do all of this in the R lab next. Yes, if there are any, if anything doesn't run, it's because we're using Gareth's computer. So just be warned. Can I make a joke about how your computer is a PC? Daniela doesn't like PCs. So. Yeah, it's, I've, I've never been seen with a PC before. This is hopefully she the first and last time. She wanted to make it clear time. that this is not her I computer. I actually wanted to put an Apple sticker on this, um, but I did not have one with me, so I wasn't able to do that. Dell would probably sue you as well. <laughs> All right.